The Viking states grew out of the most extensive military expansion the world had ever seen since Roman times. Scandinavian warriors took their thirst for conquest from the heart of the Viking homeland to the very edges of Europe. Along the way, they laid the foundations of states that are still with us today. Archaeologists from Moscow, Russia, are washing out the remains of Viking Age tombs near Novgorod on the great Volkov River. Discoveries here and elsewhere in Europe are revealing an unknown quality of these Scandinavian adventurers. The merciless pagans built enduring kingdoms and empires all over Europe. So first they came here to build a state, then they saw that they had opportunities to become rich. Above all, they were adventurers, or people who made a living in this way, such as the clan of Rurik, who brought with them their own Drujina, or band of warriors, who were nothing more than hired mercenaries. What archaeology is very good at is breaking down this idea that the Vikings are compartmentalised, the Anglo-Saxon world is compartmentalised, the, 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 the Picts and the Celts are compartmentalised, and actually we start to bring that bleeding of the edges together. The 8th of June, 793 AD, marks the opening of the Viking Age. A handful of pirates attacked the holy island of Lindisfarne and left within a few hours. 70 years later, four Viking warriors landed with an army. Halfdan, Ivar, Guthrum and Ubba wrote their names in blood as in 865, their band of raiders, known as the Great Heathen Army, made its way to York in northern England. The city was one of two capitals of the deeply divided kingdom of Northumbria. The amazing Viking military machine swept away England's part-time armies and pillaged the countryside, mainly churches. Ivor, one of the Viking leaders of the great heathen army captured the capital of Mercia, here at Repton, central England, and made it into his base. A mass grave found here is dated to 873 AD by an English penny found among the skeletons, spread around a central grave of a tall male warrior, possibly Ivar himself. Nearby, dozens of Viking tumuli found at Heath Wood suggest that this was their military cemetery. In the same year, the followers of another of the Viking leaders, Halfdan, began farming the land of Northumbria to sustain themselves during the long winter. It was the beginning of the Scandinavian settlement of England. Over the next two centuries, huge swathes of the British Isles became part of a vast Viking empire. The Vikings made York their capital in England. Peter Connolly is the lead archaeologist on the Hungate excavation site in modern-day York in England, once the capital of a Viking kingdom. York is the dominant urban place in the north of England at that time and has a population of, for sake of argument, 10,000. Um, so extrapolating out into that, um, when you start to talk about small farmsteads, um, and um, small village, hamlets, communities, other small seaside towns um, or on rivers. I mean, we're not talking a massive population. Hundreds of thousands, um, say for the, the north of England into Scotland, but I'd be very surprised if anybody estimated um, upwards of a million. In England, Alfred, King of Wessex, was the last Saxon king to resist the Viking onslaught. His response was to reform his state. He set up a standing army and navy and fortified the towns of southern England. The increased efficiency of Alfred's Wessex not only stopped the Viking conquest, but served as a model for the invaders too. The treaty between Alfred and the last surviving leader of the great heathen army, Guthrum, 
left a large part of England under Viking control, an area that came to be known as Danelaw. But Guthrum became a Christian. Raiders from Ireland and Scandinavia continued to view York as the capital of a great Viking realm. But Alfred's successors repeatedly repulsed the attacks, and in 920 AD, even the city of York recognized King Edward the Elder as the sole king of England. The Vikings raided Scotland too, capturing the castle at Dunotter on the east coast and Dumbarton on the River Clyde, mercilessly taking hundreds of slaves to Ireland. The new kingdom of Strathclyde, now in the heart of Glasgow, grew out of the ashes of Dumbarton. Its religious centre was Govan. An early medieval religious site um, and is within the kingdom of Strathclyde. Um, there has been um, the movement of the, the royal power base from Dumbarton Rock, undoubtedly influenced by the Vikings themselves, um, in further up the Clyde. Over time, the North Humbrian and Scottish Vikings were converted to Christianity and the local and Scandinavian cultures merged. We have quite a complex kingdom set up with the, the Picts and the Scots and the Gaels and Strathclyde and um, the, the, the Northumbrian sort of Anglo-Saxon population as well. So, you know, you're getting quite a hot pot of um, different cultures coming through. The Hogsback tombs of Govan were the work of a school of sculptors, evidence of an efficient and prosperous new kingdom. There are obvious um, connections um, in the belief systems of the, the, the mixture of Strathclyde and Viking Age culture um, that you see on the west coast of Scotland and you're seeing, say, on the east coast of England. Hogsback tombs in Govan and here in Bolton, North Yorkshire, represent typical Scandinavian longhouses with bears at either end. They show how the Viking motifs continued to be used well after the Scandinavian invaders had been converted to Christianity. Evidence of the dominant Scandinavian culture in York can be seen at the Jorvik Center, built to house the findings of the Coppergate excavation site. The comb was an ornament no Viking man would do without, and they were made here from deer antlers. While Viking jewelry and bronze work show Scandinavian patterns. The Vikings of York ate a lot of fish and oysters, and this coprolite, fossilized faeces, tells us more about what they ate. The diet is very interesting because we have coprolites, um, which gives us some insights into um, the diet, and so fruit seeds surviving, what we'd think of as plums and damsons. There are huge amounts of animal bone thrown out into waste pits. And we're talking about a high consumption of um, beef, um, to a lesser extent, pig, um, but, uh, but we get all the major domesticates. The Viking raids against the great empire of Charlemagne in 799 turned into invasions 40 years later, when his grandsons began a bloody civil war, leaving the empire's coastline undefended. An average Viking raid, of course, much depends on the period, but we're talking about several dozens of warriors, and the larger raids, several hundred. That's the average. In 841, 13 ships sailed up the River Seine, and the Vikings burned Rouen, took the monks of Jumiège hostage, and in 845, even plundered Paris. In 885, thousands of Vikings besieged Paris again, and although the raiding forces were still unable to take on the might of the empire's armies, they used every opportunity to strike where the defenders were weakest. There were already interactions with the Frankish elites, 
So there was a range of relationships, from political to trade, understandings, and even at times alliances, because it happened that Frankish leaders asked the Scandinavians to work for them as mercenaries. In 911, the King of France, Charles the Simple, handed over to the Vikings the western seaboard of what is modern-day France in exchange for their protection against further raids. Their leader, Rollo, became a Christian and gained the administrative tools to build a great kingdom. One of the conditions was loyalty to the king and conversion, the baptism of the Scandinavian chiefs in Rollo's court. So that seems indispensable if they wanted to settle. Towns like Dieppe, whose name derives from deep in Danish, thrived with new trade routes to the north. The Vikings adopted the local language and merged with the local population forging a new and powerful state. Even if peace had come to England and France, the politics of the rising kingdoms of Norway and Denmark continued to be played out on the English stage, and the Viking era was far from over. The rise of two aggressive and mutually hostile royal dynasties in Norway and Denmark heavily influenced events in modern-day France and England. In the 870s, King Harald Fairhair used his control of the strategic straits on Norway's western shoreline on Kamoy Island to build a new state, provoking an exodus of warriors forced into a life of a Viking, a word that came to mean adventurer. Marit Vea is the lead archaeologist at the Orvaldsnes excavation on Kamoy Island. The last battle was in Havsfjord, around year 870. And when Harald Fairhair won this battle, he made Avaldnes into his most important royal estate, because this was where he could control the shipping traffic on the Norwegian coast the best. Events in Norway impacted politics in England too. In 920, Harald Fairhair died, and his son, Eric Bloodaxe, took his place. But he was defeated and exiled by his English-educated brother, Hakon the Good. The fragile peace that had settled on England, Norway, and Denmark was about to be shattered. In 847, the restless nobles of Northumbria in England invited the pagan exile, Eric, to rule over them. They elected him king here at Ripon Cathedral, and began minting coins in his name. The Saxon reaction was devastating. King Edred had Ripon Cathedral burned to the ground, and the terrified Northumbrians withdrew their support of Eric, who was killed in battle after a second attempt to win the throne of York. As we shall see, his Danish wife and a brood of dispossessed children thirsted for vengeance. During these upheavals, York continued to thrive, and Saxons and Scandinavians mostly lived in peace. The city of York grew, and the Scandinavian and Saxon populations merged in the most surprising way. Even building materials showed curious interaction between communities. The very first um, building that we excavated in Hungary, um, the preservation was very good. You think of these buildings as a big rectangular hole dug into the ground to stop those earthen sides collapsing. You need to line them um, with wood and posts. And as our wood technology experts started to remove the boards or clean them up and look at them, he realised that they were all parts of the hull of a ship. These weren't boards from a Viking ship. They were actually from an Anglo-Saxon boat. The building techniques show how society changed over the decades after the fall of Eric Bloodaxe, and a more peaceful period began. When we start to see, um, say, the sunken feature buildings develop in the latter half of the 10th century, um, they fit with a sequence of archaeology that we see in places like Oxford um, and London and Chester, and we're probably seeing a post-Bloodaxe um, confirmation 
of uh, a stronger Anglo-Saxon culture starting to move up through the country itself. The Danes in England continued to maintain a separate ethnic identity well into the 11th century. As we shall see, one especially violent incident in an already violent age precipitated a full-scale invasion by the Viking king of Denmark. In an early example of ethnic cleansing, King Ethelred ordered the murder of all Danes in England on St. Brice's Day, 1002. Possible evidence of this was found in St. John's College, Oxford, when a car park was being built behind new student accommodation. Mark Pollard is the forensic archaeologist appointed to examine the skeletons. The ditch was outside the city walls, so one assumes that, that the people were marched out, if they were in the city, were taken out and executed, and then just pushed in the ditch. The most advanced scientific techniques were used to identify who they were and why they died. We first radiocarbon dated a selection of them. We then began to look at the carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the bone collagen, which is an indicator of diet. Um, and we also looked at the strontium and oxygen isotopes in the dental enamel from the teeth, um, because that gives you some indication of where those individuals uh, grew up. Dating the bodies was complicated by the probability that the victims had a high marine protein diet. But if people have a large proportion of marine protein in the diet, then this can actually show up in the radiocarbon date as uh, making it earlier than we would expect. So when we dated the St John's College uh, skeletons, we, we, we found that the radiocarbon ages were up to 100 years earlier than 1002 AD. However, strontium and oxygen isotope analysis of their tooth enamel gave some indication as to where they grew up. It's difficult to say where they did come from, but it's, I think it's reasonably confidently we can say that uh, they weren't brought up in the south of England. Were these Viking raiders or innocent Danish traders caught in the city on the day of collective Saxon paranoia? Could the skeletons found in St. John's College have been victims of the St. Brice's Day massacre? And how did their fate tie into the spread of a wider Scandinavian empire. For the St John's skeletons, um, we don't think they came from the south of England. They have a, a young demography, 16 to 25 in general. They're all male. Uh, some of them are carrying uh, healed battle wounds. So that, to me, suggests that what you've got is a, a raiding party. Whether or not these men were victims of the Saxon massacre, they represent a new and vital clue in showing the violent social tensions that were rife in English society in the Viking Age. The St. Price's Day Massacre sent shockwaves through Scandinavia. The new king of Denmark, Sven Forkbeard, attacked England with a mighty army. This was not a band of raiders. Sven's army was a formidable military machine. Shield wall clashed with shield wall in a war of conquest that left Sven king of England in 1014. His dominions stretched from Poland to England and Norway, and his son Canute inherited the first Viking empire. Sven Forkbeard's wife came from Poland, whose waterways were a vital part of the Viking trade network stretching to the Black Sea. Professor Czeslaw Skrok believes all the evidence points to direct Viking control. It was very quick because it was a small group, about 500 people. They drove in here like a corporation, like the Mafia, and they built their own place. Clues pointing to the origins of the Polish nation were found close to the River Vistula, one of the Viking thoroughfares from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Here at Boja, close to the Viking hub of Wokławek, a multi-ethnic cemetery seems to prove this was one of the centers of trade between East and West. Professor Andrzej Buka excavated the site. There were four objects of warriors' equipment in these graves which we searched. 
They were characteristic because they related to different territories. In one grave we have a Viking's land sax, dated to the end of the 10th century and the beginning of the 11th. And what we excavated there was connected with the Scandinavian community and warriors from northern and western parts of Europe. Bolgia was a truly cosmopolitan cemetery, showing how Viking society was based on trade as much as pillage. The fine Frankish amulet holder and Byzantine coins found alongside the central Scandinavian burial show that many cultural influences were at play here. We found artifacts that come from northern, western, southern and eastern Europe. So we can say that in one place we found objects from the whole of Europe that are concentrated in less than 50 square meters. When Sven Forkbeard chose the daughter of the first Polish king, Mieszka, as his wife, he was forging an alliance with one of the gatekeepers of the Eastern Plains. Czeslaw Skrok believes Mieszka was a Viking. The important thing about the sister of Borysław Czobry, I mean the daughter of Mieszko I, Zwietosława, was that she had a super career. She was the mother of kings Canut and Harald. They say she was a Slavic woman, but she couldn't have been. She had to be from a Scandinavian family, a very important clan. Jelling, central Denmark, was the heart of Sven Forkbeard's Viking kingdom. This runestone was erected by Harald Bluetooth, Sven's father, and commemorates the last pagan king of Denmark and founder of the dynasty that still reigns over the country today. King Harald bade these memorials to be made, after Gorm, his father, and Thera, his mother. The Harald who won the whole of Denmark and Norway and turned the Danes to Christianity. Gorm the Old laid claim to the Kingdom of Norway and controlled the southern coastline of Norway and Sweden. His daughter was married to Eric Bloodaxe, and when the Norwegian Viking was killed in England, she sent her children to fight their uncle on Karmoy Island, here on the Blood Heights. They sailed past here over to Avadnes and met the then ruling king of Norway, Hakon the Good, in a bloody battle up on these old Bronze Age barrows on the Blood Heath. It was a bloody fight, and that is why it got its name, the Blood Heath. The blood was flowing. Here at the Blood Heights, in view of Hakon's court at Orvaldnes, three of Eric's sons perished in battle against their uncle in 953. But Hakon was fatally wounded shortly afterwards, and two surviving nephews shared the throne. The wars between Viking warlords in Norway, Sweden and Denmark sent shockwaves throughout Western and Eastern Europe and consolidated the power of the great Viking monarchs. Modern archaeology throughout Europe is building a completely new picture of who the Vikings really were. Work carried out in laboratories as far away from each other as Novgorod, Poznan and Oxford show how a Scandinavian commonwealth stretched across Europe and generated great empires. One of the most lovely little beads um, that we recovered from Hungate um, small glass bead, highly decorated, um, was made in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, probably made in Egypt. Um, turns up in a, I think, first half of the 10th century context. It has come from the Eastern Mediterranean all the way, traded through a, a, a network, um, probably a very advanced network as well, to end up in Viking Age Jorvik. A snapshot of the Scandinavian empires of the mid 11th century shows the stunning success of Viking nation-building. The Viking military machine was effective in conquest, but costly to build. Only the richest leaders could afford ships and soldiers 
to take abroad on raiding expeditions. The return on investment had to be substantial for the raid or trading expedition to be worthwhile. The most profitable trade route was eastward. The shallow keeled Viking ships sailed up the wide rivers that sliced through the Russian plains. Here, slaves, furs and amber were abundant. By 750 AD, the Scandinavians controlled the ancient Finnish and Slavic trading place at Staria Ladoga. And in 841, the same year Danes were attacking Paris, other Vikings established their first kingdom, here near Novgorod. Olesia Rude is the curator of the museum exhibition here, which holds some of the most significant Viking artifacts in Russia. The written chronicles and archaeology tell us that this village was founded by Rurik, one of the Scandinavian lords that were called Rus. He arrived in this area together with his Drusina, a band of Varangians. They had been invited by the elders of the Slavic clans who lived around Novgorod in order to create a power centre, let's say to create a stronger administrative centre. The Viking warriors pushed on up the river system and found a fortress on a bend in the river Dnieper. It became a new capital city. Kiev. Only a few years later, they were attacking Constantinople itself. Here, the Vikings were known as Varangians, or Rus. Adrian Salin is a researcher at St. Petersburg University and an expert on Viking Russia. I think that today the majority of researchers believe that the word Rus derives from the word Ruotsi, rowers. Undoubtedly, when we refer back to ancient Russian traditions, the common name Rus, with the small r, referred not to a people, but to a social group. The first chronicle of Viking Russia was written here, in Kiev, in the Monastery of the Caves, by a Christian monk by the name of Nestor. His mummified body still lies exposed for all to see. His chronicle recounts the rise of the House of Rurik, and modern archaeology confirms that the first Russian state was Varangian, or Viking. The excavations here in Rurikova Garadishche have produced hundreds of Scandinavian artifacts that confirm the story told by Nestor in his first chronicle of Russian history. The blue bead of a Viking woman's necklace is a common find here, showing that for centuries this remained a Scandinavian outpost. One particularly important artifact is this sword, one of the few branded swords made in Europe. It was an extremely valuable object. The sword in our collection is interesting mainly because of where it comes from and its shape. It is broken and bent. It comes from a Scandinavian grave. The sword was made in Western Europe, which is clear from the brand of a famous swordsmith of the Rhine Valley engraved on the blade. Albert, who made many swords for export and many made their way to the east. On the other hand, there is a theory whereby a large portion of the goods exported from Eastern Europe to the Caspian Sea by Scandinavians were slaves. It is said that the Arab slave markets in the 10th century were full of slaves from Eastern Europe. Rurik's successor, Aljek, who governed the kingdom as regent during the infancy of Rurik's son, Igor, is buried in this mound at Staria Ladaga. In 907, Aljek led an army of Rus to attack Constantinople and captured the city 
by carrying the light ships around the sea defences. The trade agreement they extracted legitimised the line of Rurik as kings of Kiev and Novgorod. Every year, great convoys of Viking ships descended the river Dnieper, hauled their goods overland around the great rapids on the waterway, and gathered here at Kherson on the Black Sea, still a busy port today, to carry their wares to the imperial capital. However, we don't see permanent conflict in the 9th and 10th centuries, probably because the population in some areas were Slavs and in others Finns, and the Scandinavians occupied certain market niches. There is no indication of trade of furs for silver outside Scandinavian culture. The great Muslim empire of Baghdad also traded with Russian Vikings and suffered their attacks. Ahmud al-Fatlan, writing in the early 10th century, describes the Vikings as still barbaric by the civilized standards of the Arabs. They were covered in tattoos, washed once a week, and held bizarre pagan rites and elaborate funerals that included human sacrifice and ship burnings. The descendants of Rurik continued to rule in Kiev until his grandson, Sviatislav, was killed by roving Pechenik warriors during a trade expedition. The kingdom was plunged into civil war. Vladimir, his natural son, defeated the legitimate heirs and became king, and in 988 converted to Christianity and married the sister of the Byzantine emperor, further legitimizing the House of Rurik as rulers by God's will. Vladimir and his successor Yaroslav continued to foster their bonds with Scandinavia and drew on the Viking homeland for warriors and goods to trade along the rivers of a vast Viking empire that stretched from the Atlantic to the Caspian Sea. The final drama of the Viking epic played out along the waterways of northern and eastern Europe. The story takes us back to the frozen north, where the sons of Eric Bloodaxe ruled after a long drawn out civil war with their uncle. The kingdoms of the Scandinavian north and east suffered years of civil war that threw up some of the greatest leaders of the whole Viking epic. Legend has it that Astrid, daughter-in-law of Harald Fairhair, fled from the wrath of the sons of Eric Bloodaxe with her three-year-old son, Olaf Tryggvason, to join her brother in Kiev, but fell prey to pirates and little Olaf was made a slave. Six years later, he was freed by his uncle, who raised him in Novgorod. He served King Vladimir as a soldier, but gained most of his prestige and wealth as a mercenary, fighting for the Holy Roman Empire against the Danish king, Harald Bluetooth, and his puppet king of Norway. The mercenary Olaf also married a Polish princess, who died young, and after years of raiding Scotland and Ireland and a second marriage to an Irish queen, Olaf was converted to Christianity. He returned to Norway and won back his rightful place on the throne as a direct descendant of Harald Fairhair. He forcibly converted Norway to Christianity and ruled from 997 for three years until defeated and killed in a naval battle against an alliance of his old enemies in an expedition to present-day Poland. His life is marked by legendary events. Olaf Tryggvason had to battle with heathen powers here at Avaldnis several times. He was here with his men I think there were 300 of them. And then a ship came into Avaldnis with seers and other sorcerers. And they came to curse the king. They threw out a magical black mist. Olaf Tryggvason 
Olaf Tryggvason was saved by his Christian beliefs, and the black cloud was thrown back at the seers. However, his reaction was less than forgiving. And this is the way they died. They were to be put out at the Skrete Sheer Rock, and when the sea got higher, the sorcerers drowned. And it was a slow death, of course. The sworn enemy of Olaf was the aggressive Harald Bluetooth, forced to convert to Christianity on his defeat by the German emperors. In the early Viking Age, kings in Denmark wielded far less power than in the Christian empires and kingdoms, where the church provided key administrative services. Tom Christensen has excavated the ancient Danish chieftain's camp at Lyre for the past 20 years. It is not that the Danes turned their backs on Europe, but they were a Germanic tribal society, which had its traditions and were tied to them. I think that the power was divided between clan chiefs. There might have been a sort of king, but not an autocratic king, as power was mainly based on alliances between the various clans. These enormous mounds at Jelling are at the centre of the largest ship setting in Scandinavia and must have represented an important pagan shrine. Evidence that Harald actually did control the whole of Denmark are these fortresses, called Trelleborgs, spread around his realm that stretched into modern-day Sweden. Each fort was circular, with four doors and longhouses in each quarter. Although Bluetooth was nominally Christian, here in Trelleborg, the remains of two children thrown into a well at the age of four show that human sacrifice continued far into his reign. Harald Bluetooth claimed the thrones of Norway and even Sweden and drew on the services of the finest pagan mercenary force of the time, the Joms Vikings, one of whom is commemorated on this runestone on the Swedish island of Erland. Based in present-day Berlin, they remained Bluetooth's allies till the end, well after he was deposed by his own son, Sven Forkbeard, in 998. He is buried in Roskilde, the first Christian parish in Denmark. The first Danish bishop was an Englishman, but the Germans wanted Denmark as a church province. So when Adam of Bremen later on wrote about the conditions in Denmark, he portrayed Harald Bluetooth as a positive leader for the Germans and stated that his burial took place in Roskilde. The Swedish, Danish and Norwegian kings looked eastwards to the great plains of Poland and Russia for their wealth and sent men and goods down the great rivers to Constantinople, where they traded with the great empire and served as mercenaries in the imperial Varangian Guard. Nearly three centuries after the first recorded Viking raid in England, the epic of the Norsemen reached its climax. This rune stone in the churchyard of Tumbo, Sweden, commemorates a Viking warrior who died in the service of the Greek emperor. Another near Uppsala commemorates a great captain. Across Scandinavia, memorial stones like this bear testament to Viking soldiers who fought in the Mediterranean. The elite Varangian guard fought along the empire's frontiers and in Italy, clashed with descendants of other Norsemen who had built a home in France. The Palace of the Normans in Palermo is a monument to the audacious Norman mercenaries who became kings of southern Italy. Two brothers from Normandy, descendants of the Viking invaders, came with their men to fight the Greeks in 1014 and stayed. They emerged the final victors after a series of long drawn out wars in southern Italy in the early 11th century. Count Robert of Hauteville finally pushed out the Arabs from Sicily to become king. He was crowned here in the Palace of the Normans by the powerful Bishop of Palermo. 
The Norman rule over Sicily was famous for its tolerance and openness to trade with the Arab world. Even farther east, in the bustling metropolis of Constantinople, a Norwegian mercenary commanded the Imperial Guard, known as the Varangian Guard. Harald Hadrada was an heir to the Norwegian throne, but working for hire in Constantinople. With regards to Harald Hadrada's trips to Constantinople and to Africa, which are also recorded in the sagas, as well as in international contemporary sources, we find small traces of the Vikings, for example, in Constantinople, where a Viking has written graffiti in a beautiful church. In, the church in, Constantinople. in 1046, Harald Hadrada turned his sights back to the homeland of Norway, where his nephew, Magnus the Good, had been elected king. Following the Viking river passages through Russia and up across the Baltic, Hadrada made his way back to Scandinavia, where he attacked Denmark and cut a deal with Magnus to rule jointly. When Magnus died, Hadrada became the sole king. Harald's reign in Norway and Denmark was one of peace and prosperity, with the emergence of churches, towns, and thriving trade and minted money. Hadrada's ambition was to recreate Canute's North Atlantic Empire. He claimed the Danish throne, and then was invited by the exiled half-brother of the English king to take the English throne as well. In 1066, Harald set sail from Norway. Other powerful kings had their eyes on the English throne. In Normandy, Duke William had been promised the throne and now was preparing to take it by force. In William's view, King Harold Godwinson of England was a usurper the Bayer Tapestry supports William's claim to the English throne and describes how he went about winning it for himself. The Duke of Normandy could count on important allies in his bid. On the 12th of August, 1066, William's fleet sailed up the coast of France and stopped in the ports of Normandy as it collected soldiers from the Viking settlements. The Norman Armada landed at Pevensey on the 28th of September and made its way to Hastings. As William and Harold Hadrada bore down toward England, the English King Harold Godwinson rushed north with his army. Harold Hadrada defeated the English at Fulford on the outskirts of York, but when the might of the English army met the Viking hordes at Stamford Bridge, Hadrada was killed in battle. The exhausted English army marched south again to face William of Normandy at Hastings, just 19 days later. The Norman cavalry fled in front of the Saxon shield wall and William was given up for dead. The Saxons broke ranks to pursue the Normans, but when William showed his face to his men, the Normans rallied and Harold was killed. William was crowned King of England on Christmas Day, 1066. William, a descendant of the Northmen, was now King of England. Viking kingdoms would flourish, stabilize, and become Christian in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Southern Italy, England, Scotland, and Ireland. But the largest kingdoms took root in the far-flung steppes and forests of Poland and Russia, where Rurik's descendants ruled for another 400 years. <laughs>